Adventures in Retouching with Rob D. Caterino. Welcome to Adventures in Retouching. I'm Rob D. Caterino, and I'm here with my guest today, friend, colleague, and fellow retoucher, Miriam Ramos. Welcome to Adventures in Retouching. Hi. How are you doing, Miriam? I'm good. I'm in New Jersey. Where are you? New Jersey. New Jersey. So we're all <laughs> so <laughs> we're both in New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah, like we're we're in the New York City area, so the hub of of uh, you know retouching the retouching capital. So Miriam, let's start off. If you walk me through your background, uh, just from where you started all the way up to where you are today? So I started, I actually started out as um, an art education major in college. I started out painting because that's what I knew. So I was a painting major and then my family made so many like suggestions as to what I could like make a career out of and they're all very supportive. So I ultimately decided on um, art education. So I did that for a while and was very close to finishing um, like about a year away from it. And I started doing like these um, like substitute teacher sit-ins and observations. And I kind of realized I didn't like children. So it just wasn't something that I felt would be fair to me or to the students if I was going into it with that perspective. So um, I just kind of put, put a halt on that. And um, fortunately, that semester I had like a photography class as one of my electives and I started taking photography and it was like a black and white film class in the dark room with like enlargers and you know you print with all the, the chemicals and the bins in the dark and develop your own film and I was absolutely obsessed with it and like thinking about it what can I shoot what can I do I'm going to be an H and just spending all my money there buying like photo paper and trying out different kinds of cameras and things like that and um I ended up being a photography major. Um, I graduated with that, but unfortunately when I graduated, I'm totally dating myself here, but it was like 2007, I graduated college and that was at the height of the recession. So it was very, very difficult for me to find a job. Um, my first job was actually working at Bloomingdale's full time. It was really hard to swallow, um, you know, having a college degree, spending all that money and finally finding photography and I couldn't find a job. And I was just like very frustrated. So I was doing like all these kind of like little side things like, um, you know, shooting somebody's like baptism or sweet 16 or birthday party or you want headshots because you're an actor, hit me up, like, you know, all different kinds of like things just to just to feel like what I went to school for was being put to use or something. And um, eventually I landed a job at a wedding photography studio. And what they did was I had two roles. I was a photographer on the, on the weekends for weddings during wedding season. And then during the week I would design wedding albums. So um, I had like very little experience in Photoshop. So when I started this job, designing albums there was this like girl there who was just like you know show me like little random things to do I like figured out the clone stamp I'm like what you can just copy something and put it over there that's so cool and ultimately the thing was like when I was designing the wedding albums a lot of times I had to like you know retouch photos of like the bride and like how brides wear like strapless gowns um and a lot of times when you have strapless crowns, you have like that, that like armpit hang. So they always wanted me to kind of like smoosh it in. And I'm like, well, how do you do that? And then my coworker showed me the liquify tool. And I was like, what? This is crazy. It's so cool. So then after that, I was like totally obsessed. And, you know, 
I took continuing education classes at the um, International Center for Photography. It was just like a basic Photoshop class. So I could like have like more knowledge of it from an actual like photography school that could teach me because I didn't feel like in college I really like got as much knowledge as I wanted. So I took like a basic Photoshop like 101 class and you know got some like cool information that I kind of took with me but um, ultimately I ended up like looking up YouTube videos and um, you know downloading like digital books and like asking my friends to like let me take pictures of them so I could practice or you know bringing my SLR with me to parties to take pictures of things so I could download them at home and practice like re retouching stuff at home and you know just lots, lots of YouTube videos and trial and error and ultimately I ended up getting laid off from that wedding photography job um, because it was around 2009 so it was still like recession-y so uh, what ultimately catapulted me into the retouching was I saw this post on Craigslist from this um, f fashion photographer in New York City who was looking for a retoucher to you know help her during fashion week to like batch retouch photos and you know work on some of her like personal projects and things and I went over to um, to her studio and she interviewed me and she's like do you know how to use a Wacom tablet? And I'm like, oh. She's like, well, you're gonna learn. So I was actually like really happy that she took me in willing to like teach me that because I'm sure there were probably lots of other people who knew how to use a tablet, but basically like it was me and a whole bunch of other retouchers like working in her kitchen table. She was paying us with salad for lunch and we were working on all her like high-end like photography shoots with her models she have models come in from like Victoria's Secret to do like different side things like I don't know splash paint on them and do this like crazy makeup stuff and she would like she sat next to me and would like teach me these like tips and tricks like command J makes a new layer I'm like what what is that that's so cool so I I was able to, with her permission, she let me take um, some of her like super high resolution images at home and I practiced and she shot with a um, four by five camera, but it had a digital back. So the images were like super, super high res. Like I could see like the mitochondria in these models eyes. It was like crazy. So I was able to like really zoom in and like practice my photo retouching on these great quality images. And um, the internship ended. Um, and then I ended up getting a job at Century 21 department stores. And it was kind of like a learning curve because um, working at the internship, I was used to working on these like really creative, cool, like high resolution fashion images. But at Century 21 department stores, it was like they were a startup e -com at the time. It was back in like 2010. So the retouching was just very like straightforward. Like basically I was just cutting out the images to white and relabeling and cropping. And I just felt like this is so boring. Like I didn't feel like I was putting anything that I learned at that internship to work. So at night I would go home and I would like just practice on my own stuff. And, you know, I'd always do like my own shoots to, to build my website and I'd practice on those images and everything and um, upload them and, you know, do like before and afters and, Eventually, I ended up um, getting a job at Net-A-Porter, and then my retouching skills there actually improved so much. I mean, it was still e-commerce, but we, like, you were my boss there eventually, um, a few months after I started, but there was, like, a lot of opportunity to, like, learn different things. Like, I learned a lot from you, Rob, like, with your, you know, classes that you like schedule during the day you're like oh you want to learn how to color correct or change one shirt to another I'm like I didn't even know how to do that because it's century 21 we didn't color correct I'm like how do you make a red shirt blue I'm like I get to learn this this is so cool so I just learned so many like things from your little workshop and things and then eventually it just just came naturally to me I worked at Netta Porter for like five years and you know with all the same tips and tricks you taught us combined with like creative projects that we able to do there and just talking to like I mean I worked with like 
almost 24 other retouchers who had, you know, differing levels of knowledge. So, you know, you pick up stuff from your coworkers and like, I remember we'd have like, um, one retoucher would sit with another, watch them retouch, and you'd like pick up things from them or they'd pick up things from me. So it was just kind of like an exchange of like knowledge and things and you just kind of like learn and grow and evolve. And, you know, now I feel like, you know, I'm pretty advanced. I'm comfortable at my level of knowledge in Photoshop. Um, I made it to senior level when I was at Knit a Quarter and you know, my eyes just really trained now. I like look at an image and literally in like, I don't know, less than like five seconds, I can just tell like what to fix. And it's not that anything is wrong with anyone. It's just like, I'm already trained to like what the media standard is and what people want other people to look like to sell them things. So that's, that's my, uh, my journey. It was all, probably through 2009 up until now. So that's 11 years. I can't believe I've been doing it that long. <laughs> and where are you now, Miriam? I'm a retoucher, just like, that's just the title, retoucher. It's not senior or anything, just regular retoucher. And then I have what they call an associate retoucher who um, works alongside me. And, you know, I get more of the managerial aspects. Like, you know, I work out what we have to do for the next couple of days during the week and like ass assign workload and, you know, just kind of map out like our quota for the day, what projects to prioritize and everything. And, um, you know, it's just straight e-commerce stuff. They'll shoot in the studio and, you know, if they need any kind of like opinions or help or on-site retouching, you know, they'll, you know, ask me to pop in the back and, you know, take a look, give them opinions, you know, I try to give them like helpful tips and tricks as to like what to do to make my life easier when they're shooting models. Because a lot of times people that are on set don't really know, you know, what could, what a simple fix on their end could be like saving me like half an hour on my end. So that's great. How, how's your experience there so far it's in general? It's good. I mean, it's like straightforward e-commerce retouching, but I was told that there's going to be more creative opportunities. So when we do get to work on things like lookbooks and catalogs or just like, you know, shooting like creative um, shots for like shoes or like handbags and things that always makes me happy because it's like, it's more engaging to retouch than just like an e-commerce image was just, just like, you know, a top on a model and three different angles and like a flat, which, you know, it's fine. And it's good to like do that work. Cause it's like, it's like good base work just to like keep you going. But what I really like to do is that like high detail stuff that I was doing at that internship, you know, that like high end, like, like artwork kind of thing. Cause I was a painting major and to me, retouching is kind of like digital painting. So I like to really be able to like give my image, images like lots of like love and care and, you know, really take time to like make them look perfect. But like, as you know, in e-commerce, there's really not like an opportunity to do that. I mean, I'm not like putting out images that I think are bad, but there's like a line between like, I'm not going to zoom in to like a hundred percent and like, you know, sit there retouching like the veins on the model's eyeballs, you know, and it's like, you know, you just got to like get it done. So I have like a good balance between like quantity and quality. So how did you make that transition from photography and now here you are in design and, and in retouching? How did you feel about that? And, and like, how, how did that work? Well, I think initially, because my first like real job in the like photo industry was at a wedding photography company. So when I was pursuing my photography career. Um, I was doing weddings and I mean, I'm sure you've done your share of weddings as well. They're very like emotionally and physically exhausting. So, you know, I was sometimes working like 60 or 70 hour weeks, like, you know, the 40 hours a week during the week designing and retouching the images for the wedding album but then on the weekends during wedding season I was working like Saturdays and Sundays for a wedding and a wedding you'll be with the you'll you'll be there from like I don't know six o'clock in the morning when the bride's getting her makeup done to like when the reception's over at like 1 a.m. I'm more comfortable 
being an introverted person, I'm just like, I like to keep it to myself. And the way I recharge is just having alone time and being a wedding photographer, you have to be very like extroverted and talkative and, you know, animated and assertive and, you know, taking that internship in um, New York City after I had gotten laid off from the wedding photography job kind of showed me that I could still be in the photo industry, but take more of like, um, like a post-production, more like when you're a retoucher, you don't have to deal with people. Not like you have to deal with people, obviously your coworkers and, you know, the head of the studio and the photographers that are there, but just not like the general public which is like not where I thrive. I'm not like a thriving customer service people person. I just, you know, like to, you know, be by myself, work on my images and just, that's just where I thrive. So again, you graduated school and then you were working, but during that time you were taking classes uh, on your own time. Yeah. So can you speak a little bit about that? Like, ju just just in case, uh, hey, any of our viewers, like, well, I finished school, I'm going to go to work, and then, and I'm just, and I'm going to work. It's like, well, but but you're continuing to be proactive and continuing to learn, and and, uh, and it sounds like you, you have the attitude, always be learning. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, at that time, I figured that was a good route for me to take since, you know, I became so enamored with Photoshop and I didn't know anybody else who, who did that. So my just natural inclination was like, well, I'll just find somewhere that can teach me so I can know. Cause I, once I started learning about Photoshop, I'm like, no, this is what I want to do. I'm, I'm not going to lie, there were like so many nights where I'd be up like frustrated and crying because I couldn't figure out like the path tool and like now I just path like it's nobody's <laughs> business. Um, I stay in like quick mask and pathing and like it's just like ne comes naturally to me but in the beginning it wasn't so much. You just, you got to practice and be, be lucky enough to ha be around people or to have companies that are willing to take you in and like show you and let you learn how do you feel about over retouching is there such a thing as dangerous retouching in your opinion and if so what's the line between quote good retouching and dangerous retouching i do battle with this a lot um i feel like okay when i tell people that i'm a photo retoucher maybe 70% of the time, people don't know what that is. I actually had somebody once be like, so you like touch the models? I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not what it is. And it's actually like, very alarming to me that like people don't know what it is, but it influences and affects their lives like on a daily basis. Like all the images you see, you know, on like billboards or like when you're shopping online or scrolling through your Instagram feed and all those things are retouched, but people that are just like general population, like look at those images and think that people actually look like that. Um, the line where I think could get dangerous is like younger people trying to like build their self-esteem on these like beauty aesthetics that are like unattainable and I have that perspective that like I know they're unattainable because I'm working on these models that are models and they're human just like me and you they have their flaws nobody is perfect I think that gets dangerous when like you know like a kid's like flipping through a magazine and looks at these people and they're like oh I should look like this when it's like no they don't even really look like that and a lot of times I'd have people ask me if like being a photo retoucher like makes me feel bad or have low self-esteem and like know if anything it like boosts my self-esteem because I know that people and things don't actually look that way you know and the thing that is kind of like dangerous is that like not even to toot my own horn but like I'm so good that what I do that when you see an image you can't even tell that it's not real 
because the whole job of retouching is to retouch so it looks natural. I feel kind of guilty that I contribute to that, but at the same time, I'm good at what I do and I enjoy what I do and I look at it as an art. And when I can, and if I'm around someone that is like younger or just like anybody in general and they ask what I do, I have like a bunch of before and afters on my phone or like on my website where I'm like, look, this is a model. And I'll like zoom in and they're like, what? I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, look, look what I did to her. They're like, oh my God, thank you so much for showing me that. No, I don't feel so bad about myself. I'm like, that's basically everything you look at. Everything you're looking at is retouched. Every single thing. You can even put filters on your, on your Zoom call so you could look nice. <laughs> it could be a picture of a cup of coffee mm -hmm. in a lifestyle magazine. <laughs> and it will have some level of retouching done to it. Not even necessarily to trick people, but just because of the printing process, you have to, it has to be converted to certain profiles and certain colors shift and so you have to compensate for the shift in colors and, the, and the, so every every single image to Everything. some extent has been through a retouching process and then sometimes when i still see people just like flipping through magazines and like let's say they come across like i don't know like a makeup or a perfume and they're just flipping i'm like if you even knew how long it's like when i used to do um beauty products and makeup products and perfumes there's like know, like 10 layers that you have to merge into painstakingly merge into one to make look absolutely perfect just to have somebody just flip over and glance and i'm like do you know how long it took me i know if i look at old newspaper advertisements or magazine advertisements or posters they were all illustrated and painted so, so that was advertised. You want to illustrate your, your advertisement for your, and sell your product. You had a, a, um, you know, a painting or an illustration. And the person doing the painting or the illustration, it's going to be an idealized version of the product or a scene or look how much fun these people are having. Once advertisements were able to use photography. Well, again, it's the same thing. You're, you're painting a picture, right? the art director, the creative director, the stylist, mm -hmm. the photographer, the lighting. It's painting a picture, except in this case, it's, it's via photography, but it's still painting an idealized picture. So that's what we do. It's, 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 um, it's finishing a photo. It's putting yeah. the finishing touches on this digital illustration. And I mean, I feel like now a lot of people have like those photo editing apps like on their phones, like, you know, the Facetune and whatever. So like you get your general population who has access to that and they can like, they're, they're the ones over retouching. Like I could look at their images and be like, I saw you yesterday. You don't look like that. <laughs> Imagine 50 years from now when people are looking back on photos from our time people will look back on our time and think, why was everybody so blurry back then? <laughs> yeah. They're like, what was this, what was going on 50 years ago that everybody's face was like, it looked like it was made out of clay. Like, what, what were people doing back then? <laughs> Can you explain your setup? So I, I ideally like like a nice like non-glossy screen with like a nice box around it and being in a dark room, but you know, home setups aren't um, as ideal. But I have a Wacom Intuos 4 tablet. Yeah, medium size, um, an iMac and my Photoshop. And I cannot work without my tablet. I, I remember going into this and practicing when I was first practicing retouching and taking that continuing education class. I was a mouse clicker and I, that's probably why I was crying when I was trying to pass. So Miriam, what is retouching? I mean, I guess it can mean a lot of things. It depends on what perspective it is. Um, enhancing an image to make it look its best and help a company sell its product. Um, and then personally, um, 
you know, put a smile on somebody's face to make you feel like what I what I do a lot at work. Um, I make my coworkers birthday cards, and I'll like Photoshop. I mean, I I got that idea initially from working at Meta Porter, and I carried it over into my new job. But putting a smile on people's face by like you know making a cute card for their birthday, like maybe you know putting their head on a celebrity next to a celebrity or photoshopping their head on like Kim Kardashian's body and like, <laughs> you know, just like funny things like that or doing something, you know, really poignant. Like um, I restored a photo of my fiance's grandmother after she passed. Um, there was a really beautiful photo of her when she was in like, you know, her early thirties that was damaged and um, his family had it scanned and I restored it for them and, you know, gave it to them as a gift. And they were all like, just really like happy and crying and very emotional. And that like, you know, I was happy that I was able to like use my skill to like, you know, improve somebody's life, you know, make them put a smile on their face for their birthday or, you know, help them look at their old picture of their grandmother and like brand new condition, just like bring some light into people's lives. So it really depends on like what you're, using it for. My favorite is um, photo restoration. I like love that because you just, it's so just like intricate and time consuming. And it just, that those are the things that I like. The more challenging, the better. Unfortunately, um, that's not where a lot of like full-time employment comes from. So you know, you kind of have to do the mainstream retouching to like, you know, make an income, but. I agree. I love photo restoration. That's one of my hobbies as well. I view it as it's, it's the closest that I'm ever going to get to time travel. Yeah, that too. It's, it's nice. Like when you can do that. And then also when you're looking at the photo, you're just like wondering, like, you know, that moment in time, what were they thinking? Like, what was the weather like? Like, you know, or if you see like, you know, a picture of them when they were younger, like, wow, they looked like this and they look like this now. And it's just like very nostalgic and just very like just satisfying to like, when you do that and then it's done, you're like, wow. I did this. And then, like, I love toggling the before and after. Like, when you click on and off, I can like, do that forever. I'm like, before, after, before, after. Come over here, look, before, after. It is very satisfying. I, I agree. And of course, now birds are going to go crazy and whatever. But this is casual and informal, and we're having yeah. fun. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, but still uh, a very useful and valuable discussion and, and helpful for our viewers. So, uh, but, but hey, we're, we're just out here having fun. And, uh, yeah. You know, this isn't like broadcast TV. Uh, we're, we're just having a fun conversation. Fun but helpful. So Miriam, what are some things you are going to look for on a resume for someone just starting out, but, they, but, but these are the key things that that person still needs on a resume or on a website or portfolio? Learn how to, or know, have knowledge of how to retouch on a Wacom tablet. And I guess a lot of patience because, um, you know, Photoshop can be very like, intricate and frustrating and you know there's like so many different ways to do the same thing so just like an openness and willingness to learn um i come across a lot of photo retouchers who are just like kind of set in their ways and not open to learning and i mean i feel like not even just in photo retouching but you know you can apply this to your life in general there's always something for you to to learn. I don't know everything. And, you know, a lot of times there'll be somebody who just got into photo retouching that would like show me something new. And I was like, wow, I never knew that. Thank you. You know, just little things like that. So not a big ego, open, openness and willingness to learn and just no gauge and blur on portraits that are up on your site. Cause obviously then you don't, have an eye for <laughs> what good photo retouching is. So yes, when you're retouching skin, do not just lasso the skin and do a Gaussian blur and like, look, I blurred the, yeah, no. 
That's the really second I would see that not, in, on your website, like next. Yeah. Yeah, not trying to say, hey, you know what? Everyone starts somewhere. I had yeah, to start Yeah, but I mean, if you're somewhere. looking for a job, you're you're not Gaussian blurring. You're still interning, if that's the case. Like. <laughs> yeah. So so that brings up a good point. So as someone in a leadership role, mm -hmm. I get a lot of applications, resumes, websites, portfolios. When I go to someone's website. If I'm looking, and, and I don't say this to be a jerk, I don't say this to gatekeep or or but w w you know, hey, we're in luxury fashion, we're in advertising, we're in marketing, social media. Brands need a certain level of of taste, a certain aesthetic, a look and feel. Yeah. So if I go to someone's website who applied for a job and it looks like it was from 1996 geo cities or oh, tripod yeah. I mean, for sure yeah so miriam what are some things as a retoucher that make your life more difficult that frustrate you that are blockers when you're trying to retouch like maybe things that happen on set and also the opposite, what are some things as a retoucher that make your life easier, that make your process better, that make you happy, and you could do your job happily? I would say scuffed floors when, you know, it's like e-commerce, a lot of times I'll spend more time cleaning the floor. Just like simple things that can be fixed during the shoot that can make things better. And I mean, it's, it, 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 it's up to me. I mean, throughout my career, I've learned to be more assertive and speak up about these kind of things instead of just like grumbling and fixing it on my own. But, you know, scuff floors, um, I guess annoying flyaways or like if the garment is really wrinkled when you could just like kind of like tug at it and straighten it or, you know, have like your stylist assistant steam the garment before putting it on the model. So I don't have to, you know, iron out, digitally iron out your clothes. Um, pet peeve of mine is like models who don't um, take care of their grooming. If your company has an aesthetic where like you want your models to be like have shaved legs and shaved underarms and no tattoos, then don't give me a model with hairy legs and tattoos on her neck and her hands. Like I thought we were, we were concentrating on the clothes and then I'm spending all the time like shaving her legs and fixing her toes and shaving your armpits like it's just frustrating and a waste a waste of time like give me someone who takes care of themselves put lotion on their skin no ashy skin and it's like I complain about a lot of that like when I sit with um you know a fellow retoucher of mine and it's not that I'm saying it in terms of like being like a critical awful person like judging the person but it's like if you're a model and the company that you're shooting for has this aesthetic, then it should be your job to come presented well, because that's why they're paying you. <laughs> you know, like maybe put some makeup on the tattoo on your neck or, you know, don't go on like some crazy snowboarding trip with and then come back with bruises on your leg the day before. Don't put on self-tanner that makes your skin orange, and then I have to do, like, a whole set of skin color correction because you look like an Oompa Loompa, like. That's good. Th those are some of the challenges as a retoucher that people might not even think of. Like, like oh, yeah, they bring in the model. She went on a vacation, or he went on a trip, and now he's coming back five shades darker than before. Which isn't a, pro you know, hey, if, if, if someone has darker skin, lighter skin. Yeah, but then if they have tan lines and they want you to get rid of the tan lines. And I'm like, right. well, then why'd you go tanning? Right. Or so, so there's the tan line. Right. So, so I'm not saying the skin tone is the problem. I'm saying the tan lines or, mm. oh, well, what we shot two weeks ago, these have to be consistent they with those. Match. So you have to yeah. undo their tan or you have mm -hmm. to or you have to give them a tan because they had a tan into it. So yeah, th those are some of the things that people might not realize that, uh, yeah. that, that we do. Do you have any good memories that come to mind or funny anecdotes or, or anything like that that you can share? We were shooting a model um, live on set and um, she had come out at the end of the day and I was like super zoomed into like for like big toe 
and she was like oh my god is that my big toe and I was like yeah she's like wow <laughs> if I knew that you guys zoomed in that close to me <laughs> I had no idea and I was like yeah your, your your toes are nice like I didn't even know what to say it's also like really amazing when I'm working on like uh intimates which are like if you want something challenging <laughs> you know practice working on some uh, lacy intimates uh and when I do that um I kind of have to like zoom up very close in two people's private areas and um, where I'm set up at my job, it's kind of like open office. Uh, so everybody passes through and I'll be like zoomed in super close on somebody's part. And <laughs> people will be like, what are you doing? I'm like, my job. <laughs> Miriam, what is the future of retouching? It is kind of scary that there are like these apps that can like do what we do. I mean, they don't do what we do like, at, like, is high quality, but I feel like I am scared that like it could be automated, but there's some things that can't be that just require like the time and attention of an actual physical human being, like taking the time to do it. Um, and in terms of like industry standards, I think now people are going towards more like natural, more of a natural look, more like, you know, body positive, um, you know, people want to see what like a real person looks like. Um, and I've seen lots of brands like go more towards that. Um, you know, you see models with, you know, cellulite with, you know, wrinkles. And I think that's, that's great. And I feel like more people now that they're aware of like what retouching is and have those apps on their phone, they they are more driven to want to buy a product when they're looking at a model that like looks real or like looks like them. Can you speak to less retouching? Does that necessarily mean you're out of a job or does that mean that requires uh, an even more skilled retoucher to, to... I think it does require a more skilled retoucher because, like, it's easier to, like, make someone look flawless than to, like, have that kind of eye to know what it is to, like, what you, sh you should and should not get rid of. Like, that takes a more, like, kind of trained eye to kind of like make that judgment. It's easy to like see a face and be like, oh, I'm gonna get rid of any pore and any wrinkle and this and that. But I feel like I personally have like a gauge of what's too much and what's not. Cause even if you want a model to look more natural, there's still certain things that like I would still do. Like, you know, um, I would like, you know, still get rid of a little bit of eye bags. You know, you can always use some help with your eye bags. Everybody needs some more sleep and you don't want to look sleep deprived. So, you know, you got hair in your face. I'll help you out. You got something stuck in your tooth. Nobody wants to like have food in their teeth. So I think it does require skill to like be able to retouch in a, in a tasteful way. Miriam, what do you envision for your future? You know, am I going to be a 65 year old retoucher? Like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I know right now it's something that I enjoy, something I'm good at. Um, but I honestly, I, I don't know. And sometimes that really scares me. And I, 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 I don't know if I've like cornered myself into, you know, an industry that's like very niche and I am open to maybe doing other things in the future, but I guess I would just kind of have to live my life and see what comes my way. I mean, as I came to photo retouching, I didn't, I never said to myself when I was a kid, oh, I'm going to be a photo retoucher. It just kind of evolved that way. So I could just see in the next few years what life throws at me and what evolves my way. I mean, ideally, you know, I love, I love to run. I love running, I love fitness. I love to travel. I love dogs. I could be like a sponsored runner who walks dogs and travels the world. <laughs> could someone pay me to do that? <laughs> Maybe I could retouch for runner's world. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool. 
as a woman in our industry, have you faced any any challenges or, or any um, biases or uh, the, does that exist in our industry? I've never faced any kind of adversity being a woman in retouching. I actually find that a lot of retouchers I've encountered have been women. Everybody's been super nice and I've always felt everything's been really fair. And I can only speak to my own experience, which is it's very diverse, very yeah. diverse, all different kinds of people and ages and, and backgrounds. and Yeah. And that's one thing I really do like about like, you know, being in the fashion industry or working as a photo retoucher that I'm just, I've always been like naturally a very like creative and expressive person in terms of like, you know, how I dress and, you know, I'm heavily tattooed and I never felt discriminated against um, when working as a retoucher like that because I just feel like, you know, the industry itself is just open to that. Miriam, any final thoughts, any final bits of advice or, or things I just haven't thought of? Be open to learning new things. Um, you know, just because you've been retouching for X amount of years doesn't mean you can't learn something new. And for beginners out there, please, please, please work on a Wacom. Wacom tablet is necessary for all Professional retouchers, it's like, a, I would say retouching without a tablet is like playing a violin with a boxing glove. What are your favorite go-to tools when you're retouching? I use Quick Mask. Um, I use the Path Tool. I use Magic Wand. I use um, Spot Heal. I use the healing brush. I use um, masks all day, every day. Love, love masks. Um, masks are super important. Um, when I first started retouching, I was like queen of destructive editing. Um, always make a copy of your layer. Always have a mask. Always. You know, hue sat, curves, levels, when you're color correcting, trying to, you know, change one color to another. Excellent, well, great discussion, great information. I had a lot of fun. It was great speaking with you as always, yeah. Miriam. Where can people find you online? My Instagram, at Miriam J. Ramos. Um, there's a link to my website on my bio, so you can check that out. And you know, my website's up and, up and working. You could see all my before and afters that I've done and all my various uh, jobs from like beauty to skin to, you know, being out in nature, everything. Well, great. Thank you so much, Miriam. This has been Adventures in Retouching. I am Rob DiCaterino. Do me a favor, leave comments, like, subscribe, ask questions. If you have questions about what we talked about, if you have questions about your work, your, if you want me to look at your resume, your portfolio, I'm here to help. So ask, ask, ask. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Awesome.